Okay, so hello everyone and welcome to this week's Sets Online webinar. My name is Mariano Ramirez and I'm going to moderate today's event. Today we are very excited of launching our fourth season of Sets Online. This, this season we will have a monthly event that will occur on the second Wednesday of the month. Also for this season we are going to have 10 webinars, two great debates and two students webinars. So for students, please sign up for our student webinar, which is gonna be about the difficulties of diagenesis. And before we get started, we would like to thank our sponsorship from the International Association of Sedimentologists, which allow us to offer all these resources free of charge. Make sure and check out our web website for more information about coming events and meetings and see everything available for our community. Today's lecture is by Jeanette Lister, from the Department of Geoscience of Pennsylvania State University, also known as Penn State. Shined is a postdoctoral scholar at the College of Earth and Mineral Sciences. She got her bachelor and master in science in the University College of London, and she got her PhD in the Imperial College of London. Her current research, her current research sorry, applies novel strategies to reconstruct the morphologies, morphodynamics, and hydrodynamics of ancient rivers, as well as the erosion and sediment supply. Her talk today is entitled Constraining the Intermittency of Flu Flows and Sediment Transport in the Geological Past. So, Jeanette, the stage is all yours. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. And thank you for inviting me to talk today. It's nice to be here. Um, so yeah, um, today I'm going to talk about constraining flow and sediment transport in the geological past. Um, oh, let me just check. Um, yeah. Okay, so yeah, so my research is focused on deciphering the strat stratigraphic record of rivers. And to do this, it's important that we first acknowledge the diverse nature of modern rivers. So here we can see some examples of modern rivers. And as you can probably tell, so these rivers, they have super diverse morphologies. So they vary in terms of their size, their aspect ratio, which is just their width to depth ratio, um, and also their plan form morphology, which describes whether rivers are single thread or multi-thread, and also the style of the single thread or multi-thread rivers. Um, they also have very diverse land cover. So floodplains could be vegetated or non-vegetated, and also where they are vegetated, they can vary in the type and abundance of this vegetation. Um, their discharge regime also varies. So some rivers will flow all year round and some only flow for brief periods. Um, there are many other reasons, but the final one I'll just mention is they also vary in terms of their sediment supply. So rivers vary in terms of the amount and the type of sediment that they carry. So, I mean, you can just see here some like variation in just the color, and that's just coming from the type and abundance of sediment. Now, with super diverse modern fluvial landscapes, we should therefore expect diverse fluvial landscapes in the geological past. And this is exactly what we see when we look at the stratigraphic record. So these six images just show a range of different fluvial formations. And in case you're not familiar with looking at fluvial stratigraphy, so our channel deposits are usually these coarser, either cliff or ledge forming deposits, whereas our floodplain deposits are usually these much finer hill slope forming sediments. Now, if you get your eye into these images, you should start to be able to pick out how diverse these strata are. So we have a lot of variation in color. So here we have these red floodplain deposits. Here we have this kind of banding um, between red and grays with these kind of tan colors. And um, we also have variation in the ratio of those coarser channel deposits to those finer floodplain deposits. And you can see this nice example here. So in the lower half, we have the Black Hawk Formation, and you can see these little coarse sands peeking out through the hill slope. And then as you pass up section, you get into this kind of big kind of cliff forming coarse channel sand. Um, if I pull the scale bars up, you'll also notice variation in scale. Um, also, I, I realize that I'm creating a false impression that fieldwork is always sun and blue skies. So just to show that it isn't, we have an extra example, um, which is from the Penn and Sandstone in Wales. And I also had a point that I wanted to make here. Um, sometimes when you're working with fluvial stratigraphy, sometimes you only have those coarse channel sands. Sometimes the floodplain deposits are just covered up by modern vegetation. So when we're trying to work with fluvial stratigraphy, we kind of have to work with what we've got. 
So now, why are we even interested in deciphering fluvial stratigraphy? What can we learn about the past? So from fluvial strata, we can learn about how water and sediment were distributed across Earth's surface in the past. And um, we can learn about past hydroclimate. So things like discharge regime, precipitation regime. We can also learn about how fluvial landscapes responded to change. For example, changes in climate, land cover, sediment supply, et cetera. We can learn about past channel floodplain coupling, and we can also learn about pre-vegetation landscape dynamics on Earth, which is then applicable to other planets. Now, the overarching goal of all of this is to build up a picture of how fluvial landscapes evolve, in particular, how these fluvial landscapes evolve on millennial longer time scales, particularly in response to tectonic and climatic forcing. And this brings us to our next question, which is how exactly do we decipher fluvial stratigraphy? So a key point that I want to make here is that we have this sort of process hierarchy in fluvial stratigraphy. So from fluvial strata, we can make observations and interpretations at multiple scales. And these span kind of channel belt scales, intra-channel belt scales, bar form, bed form, and grain scales. And importantly, the processes that we can observe and interpret entirely depends on our scale of observation. For example, if we wanted to understand evulsion frequency and style, we would want to make observations at the channel belt, channel belt scale. Whereas if we wanted to understand processes such as channel reworking, we would need to make observations at the intra-channel belt and bar form scales. Um, now, what I'm particularly interested in and what I'm going to talk about today is understanding flow conditions and sediment transport in the past. And to do this, I need to make observations at the grain scale and bed form scale, but also because I'm specifically interested in working out things like total water discharges and total sediment fluxes, I also need to know what channel geometries were. So I also need to pull in elements from the bar form scale. And this brings me to my research question, which is, how can we decipher flow and sediment transport conditions in the geological past? So this is just a little bit of a roadmap of what I'm going to talk about today. So first, I'm going to give you a bit of background on the timescales on which we can investigate flow and sediment transport. I'll then run you through the concept of intermittency factors and how we can estimate intermittency factors in the geological past. And to do that, I'll use the Ferran sandstone as a case study. Um, and then I'll discuss how we can contextualize intermittency factors using Fashi's observations and how modern observations may or may not help us to constrain intermittency in the geological past. So with interest in constraining flow and sediment transport conditions in the past, we need to consider the timescales on which we can do so. So on one hand, we can reconstruct mean conditions. And by that, I mean things like mean water discharges, mean sediment fluxes, and these could be on timescales of per year, per thousand years, per million years, et cetera. And the way in which we often do that is by continental, regional, or catchment scale modeling, but also from stratigraphic methods at the sediment routing system scale. So for example, we might convert an offshore sediment volume to an onshore sediment flux. Um, and here are just some examples of how we can do this. So I had a paper in 2020 demonstrating some kind of some forward modeling of catchment flow conditions. And then a colleague, Victoria Fernandez, also had a paper showing a kind of inverse method to kind of back out flow conditions from river long profiles. So there's a couple of things we can do to get at those mean flow conditions. Um, we can also reconstruct instantaneous or near instantaneous flow conditions. And by that, I mean things like channel forming water discharges and sediment fluxes. And I just want to flag that by referring to channel forming water discharges, I'm just acknowledging that we don't necessarily know what conditions produce stratigraphy. So channel forming conditions are often taken as bankfall conditions or flood conditions, but they could feasibly reflect ordinary flow conditions. And just because we don't know, I'm just gonna to refer to them as channel forming conditions. Whatever they were, they had to be sufficient to produce stratigraphy. And we tend to reconstruct these on timescales of per second. So water discharges in meters cubed per second. And the way in which we do this are those stratigraphic methods where we make observations at the grain, bed form, and bar form scale, and then we can apply various flow and sediment transport models. Now, what about the in-between timescales? So we can reconstruct mean conditions and instantaneous conditions, but we're often particularly interested in what's in between. And by that, I mean flow variability. So when we're thinking about 
modern fluvial systems and how they might respond to climate change, we're not necessarily thinking about or paying attention to slight changes in the mean annual discharge. The things that we notice and pay attention to are drastic changes in the kind of the variability of discharge. So how does the distribution of flow change during the year? How do the extremes change? So when we're thinking about the geological past, we would quite like to be able to reconstruct that in between time scale and think about how flow variability changed in response to past climate. And again, thinking about time scales, we have many different time scales of flow variability. And I'm not going to go into this too much, but I just want to acknowledge that flow variability can occur over many time scales. And I just kind of pulled this together, thinking about what are the most useful time scales of flow variability that we need to think about when we're looking at the rock record. And the main ones that I came up with are kind of the annual to, dec annual to decadal variability. So this might reflect trends in water discharge over years to decades that might be associated with climate phenomena, such as El Nino, et cetera. Those kinds of timescales, perhaps they manifest in floodplain deposits, for example. Um, we then also have our kind of seasonal to interannual flow variability, and that typically describes the kind of shape and characteristics of the river hydrograph. And we usually consider the magnitudes and frequencies of discharge events. Um, this, again, if we're thinking about this in the geologic record, we might want to be looking at channel deposits um, at the bar scale, bed form scale. We also have the kind of near instantaneous flow variability. And that describes hydrograph shape and characteristics for individual discharge events. So it might be the shape of a flood hydrograph, the kind of the total duration of the flood event, the ratio of the rising limb to the falling limb, um, where the peak occurs, those kinds of things. And then finally, we would have our instantaneous flow variability, and that would just refer to variability in flow within a channel cross section. So these are things just to keep in mind, you know, when we go to fluvial stratigraphy, and we want to make interpretations of flow variability, we just need to stop and consider what time scale of flow variability are we actually getting at. Now, that is very tricky. So um, what I thought about using was um, something called an intermittency factor as a quite a simple way for us to start to think about flow variability in a bit more detail. So the intermittency of a river just describes the temporal distribution of flow and sediment transport. So if you think of two end members, highly intermittent system is characterized by multiple and or sustained periods of zero flow or sediment transport, whereas a non-intermittent system is characterized by persistent flow or sediment transport. And for geological investigations, so Paola et al. in 1992, introduce this dimensionless intermittency factor as a simple method of extrapolating instantaneous sediment transport equations to annual or longer time scales. Um, and this is potentially very useful for us thinking about flow variability in the geological past. So now this is going to be a little bit of a, a little bit complicated, but I hope I can get you through it. Um, so the intermittency factor is formally defined as the fraction of time in which a constant channel forming flow could transport the same amount of water or sediment as the actual hydrograph transports. And it's easier to visualize this. So if we look at this schematic here, so A is going to show us our flow intermittency and E is going to show us our sediment transport intermittency. So T0 to T1, that's just a time period, whatever you want. Let's just call it a year. Um, Q0 is zero discharge, whether it's water discharge or sediment flux. And then QWCF, that's our channel forming water discharge. And QSCF is our channel forming sediment flux. So for a flow intermittency factor of 0.33, all this means is that the entire annual water budget could be moved in 0.33 of the time if channel forming conditions were sustained. Likewise, if you had a sediment transport intermittency of 0.33, that just means that your entire annual sediment budget could be moved in 0.33 of the time if your channel forming conditions were sustained. And we can calculate this relatively easily. So here, so QW, that's just our water discharge, T is our time span. So we have the sum of water discharge over the time, so it's just our annual water budget, and it's divided by the water dis the channel forming water discharge multiplied by that same time span. And again, it's exactly the same for the sediment transport intermittency. We basically have our annual sediment budget divided by 
what the annual sediment budget would be if our channel forming sediment flux was sustained the same period. So it's just the ratio of one to the other. Now, the intermittency factor represents the time dependent integral of the hydrograph, but it doesn't necessarily mean that all of the water is moved in this one event. In reality, flow is distributed over the course of the year, and that hydrograph can have many different shapes. Similarly, for sediment transport intermittency, it's very unlikely that a river moves its entire annual sediment budget in 0.33 of the time. Just like water, the sediment is likely distributed over the course of the year. So yeah, so the intermittency factor, it's kind of a, it's a starting point. So it represents the time dependent integral of the hydrograph. It doesn't tell us the specific distribution of individual flow events because many different hydrographs could produce similar intermittency factors. But what it does do is it gives us a starting point. So where we can estimate mean flow conditions and where we can estimate instantaneous flow conditions, we can estimate an intermittency factor. And then with that, we can take that forwards and try to think about which hydrograph scenarios are most likely. And that's what I'm gonna show you now. So I tested this out for the Farron Sandstone in Utah, USA. So the Farron Sandstone is a Lake Cretaceous Tyronean uh, fluvio-deltaic complex, which crops out in central Utah, USA. And um, if you're familiar with Utah, Rice is up this way, Green River is this way. And so the Ferrin sandstone crops out in this kind of southwest to northeast trending outcrop. And very conveniently, the outcrop is pretty much aligned with the paleoflow direction. So we want to estimate the mean conditions and the instantaneous conditions for this system. So what we did is we went to the kind of the trunk channel deposits that fed the delta. So if you're familiar with the Ferran sandstone, you're probably familiar with these kind of the delta end of it. So these are very popular outcrops all along here. And I feel like the most proximal location that I often see in literature is this little dot here, which is Willow Creek. Um, so we tried to go as paleo landward as possible. We wanted to characterize the grain sizes and the geometries of these trunk channel deposits. So we went to these outcrops. Um, if you know any more recent literature of people who have been there, I would love to see it. So we were we were using Edward Cotter's, Edward Cotter's papers from back in the 80s to navigate this. And um, there are some amazing outcrops there. And if anyone wants field localities, just drop me an email. Um, so yeah, and just to show you, oh yeah, that's where we went. And just to show you uh, the depositional sequence stratigraphy, which has been very well mapped by Garrison Jr. and Vandenberg, not by me, I just colored it in. Um, but again, so this is the same outcrop. So we have our kind of Southwest to Northeast trending outcrop, paleo landward, it's more terrestrial fluvial. And then as you go paleo seaward, it gets a lot more deltaic and you go into the marine sandstones. So we were focused up in this area and we were looking at these big trunk channel deposits. In there. Um, so remember, to estimate intermittency factors, we need to estimate the mean conditions and also the instantaneous conditions. So first, I'm just going to run you through how we estimated the instantaneous conditions. So we begin with flow depths. Um, so in these trunk channel deposits, where we can find evidence of bars, we can measure their heights and we can take those as proxies for flow depths. So here are just a couple of examples here. Um, so we might take this height trying to capture the relief on that clinoform surface there. Um, and then again, down here, we have some more nice little accreting point bars and we might take this height here. We then also want to make our kind of bed form and grain scale observations. And so basically we're trying to characterize the grain sizes of deposits in the channel fill. So often we have to kind of look at the lowermost bar um, where we can't get to the channel fill. And so we characterize the grain sizes of both sand grade sediments and gravel grade sediments. So the majority of channel deposits in the Varan sandstone are sand grade, but in quite a lot of places, we had these pebbly lags at the bases of channel fills, which we also characterized. Um, so we consider, so our sand transporting flow conditions are the dominant channel forming condition. And then the gravel transporting flow conditions are the less dominant flow condition, and they potentially reflect the largest discharge events. So once we've made our observations of things like flow depths and also grain sizes, 
we can start to apply various flow and sediment transport equations to reconstruct the other geometries we need, such as paleoslope, um, but then flow and sediment transport equations um, that we can use to estimate water discharges and sediment fluxes. So there are various established equations that you could use, and these are just examples of some of those. There are many more that you could use. These are probably the most simple in that they require the fewest amount of assumptions about the geological past. But yes, so oh, this other way. Um, so yeah, so with our constraints on flow depths and grain sizes, we can start to estimate things like the paleoslope. Um, so D50 is usually our median grain size, H is flow depth, um, tau star, so that's our shield stress, which we can estimate using perhaps a bed form stability diagram. And then R is just the submerged specific density of sediment, which we normally take as 1.65. We can estimate flow velocity. So just as an, as an example, I've got Manning's equation here, which again, we're going to plug in our flow depths. We're going to plug in slope, which we've just estimated. And then N is just Manning's constant, which is normally 0.3. Then with that, our flow velocity, we can multiply our flow velocity by our channel geometry, our channel cross-sectional area to estimate the water discharge. And then for sediment flux, there are a million different equations out there that you could use. This is just one example. And this is the mayer peter muller bed load sediment transport equation. So it's quite straightforward with with a reasonable amount of field observations, it's quite straightforward to reconstruct things like water discharges and sediment fluxes and to get estimates of those instantaneous uh, flow conditions. So then we need to derive our mean flow conditions. And to do this, we're actually going to leverage paleoclimate model outputs. And to do that, we need some approximate constraints on paleocatchment geometries. Now, the Ferran sandstone actually sits on the western margin of the Lake Cretaceous Western Interior Seaway. Um, if you're not familiar with it, it was a Lake Cretaceous Seaway that basically divided North America in two. So on the Western margin, we had the Laramidia landmass and on the Eastern margin, we had the Appalachian landmass. And on this kind of active margin here, we had the severe mountains, um, which were actively uplifting, transporting huge volumes of sediment east towards the Western Interior Seaway. And these deposits are all very well studied. Um, and as you can just see here, we have three different paleogeographic reconstructions. Um, so the regional paleogeography is very well understood, which enables us to place some approximate constraints on the catchment length, catchment area. And we even have somewhat reasonable understanding of elevations in the severe highlands just from paleoaltimetry studies. Um, so we then supplemented this with additional insights into catchment geometries, uh, which came from paleo digital elevation models. So here, just kind of zooming into our field area in Utah, you can just kind of see here, if we have the shoreline of the Western Interior Seaway and the Laramidia drainage divides, that would be the kind of where the severe mountains were at the time. You have a series of these kind of short, steep catchments. And so with a good idea of the configuration and scale of these catchments, we can be begin to explore explore catchment climate using paleoclimate models. So we used outputs of HADCM3L, uh, which were which is a general circulation model or a GCM. And these were run by Alex Farnsworth, uh, our co-author at Bristol University. So HADCM3 is a regularly used climate model. It's often used in the IPCC reports. Um, whereas HADCM3L, the L just stands for lower resolution ocean. Um, and it's regularly implemented in deep time paleoclimate studies. So we used these. Um, so HADCM3L produces various different climate outputs. The ones that we were particularly interested in were mean annual temperature, mean annual precipitation, and mean precipitation of the wettest months. And with these, we can basically use zonal statistics in something like ArcGIS or in Python to estimate potential catchment averaged temperatures, catchment averaged mean annual pre precipitation, catchment averaged mean precipitation of the wettest month. Once we've done that, we can just make a first order estimate of the mean annual water budget in a catchment just by multiplying the precipitation over the catchment area and then assuming a runoff rainfall ratio, which we left as one to begin with. Um, but then we explored the sensitivity of lowering that later. 
and we can also estimate the mean annual sediment flux just using some kind of simple models such as BQRs. So BQR is an empirically derived model of long-term suspended sediment flux. Um, it was developed by Svitsky and Milliman in 2007, and it basically takes observations of catchment geometries such as the area and the relief, catchment climate variables such as the water discharge and tea temperature, um, and then we have a kind of a conversion factor, and we have a kind of a human anthropogenic factor, which we just leave as one. And with that, we can make first order estimates of the long term mean annual suspended sediment flux. We can also, as a kind of little, as a gut check, we can independently estimate the long term mean kind of sediment accumulation uh, by taking the depositional volume of the Ferran sandstone, which is very well constrained. So, well, the depositional sequence stratigraphy has been mapped in detail. And basically what we did is we assumed a solid of rotation to make a first order estimate of the total depositional volume. Um, so this is an overestimate for a number of reasons, but it's also an underestimate for a number of reasons. But I won't go into that now, but if you want to know more, you can ask me later. Um, and importantly, the age and time span of this depositional volume is well understood. So Garrison and Vandenberg, they determined that this was deposited over a period of about 1.7 million years during the Turanian. And they did this using biostratigraphic and stratigraphic correlation charts, which they calibrated using argon isotope data. So with a depositional volume and a time span of accumulation, we can make a first order estimate of the mean sediment accumulation rate. Now, I'm just going to jump straight into the results. Um, so we estimated mean water discharges, mean sediment fluxes, instantaneous water discharges, instantaneous sediment fluxes. And with those, we can return to this equation, which you've already seen, and we can estimate the flow intermittency factors. So just to walk you through this, we have the intermittency factor on the y-axis between naught and one. And then, so the first thing we did is we estimated our mean water discharge, and that was using the paleoclimate model. And we got a mean annual water discharge of around 1,600 meters cubed per second. With that, we then wanted to look at our instantaneous water discharges. So for our sand grade deposits, we estimated our sand transporting flow conditions. And we got water discharges of around 2,400 meters cubed per second. And that gave us flow intermittency factors of around 0.55 to 0.9 which basically suggests that channel forming conditions may have persisted for the majority of the year. We then took our gravel grade deposits and our gravel transporting flow conditions, which suggested water discharges of around 5,000 meters cubed per second. And using that, we estimated much smaller intermittency factors of around 0.28 to 0.38, which assuming that gravel transporting flow conditions potentially reflect the largest discharge events. This suggests that those large discharge events may have occupied these river, rivers for three to four months of the year. Um, one final thing that we did, um, which was quite nice just to kind of make the most of the paleoclimate models, is we used the mean precipitation of the wettest months as a proxy for kind of the largest discharge events. And in doing that, we estimated water discharges of around 7,200 meters cubed per second. Important to note that that's assuming a runoff rainfall ratio of one. So we would expect that to be lower. And if we do that, we end up estimating even smaller flow intermittency factors getting down to between 0 0.2, 0 0.25. Um, so yeah, so we then also estimated our sediment transport intermittency factors. Again, same equation at the top, approach one, was using our B was using the BQR suspended sediment flux. Um, sorry, no. Approach one was using the preserved depositional volume. So taking our estimates of the instantaneous sediment flux, knowledge of how long it might take to accumulate the total depositional volume, we estimated sediment transport intermittency factors that are basically less than 0.1. So that means that the entire annual budget could be transported in less than a month of the year if need be. Whereas using our second approach, which was the approach where we estimated mean sediment conditions 
using the BQL suspended sediment flux model, we got slightly larger sediment transport intermittency factors of kind of 0.1 going up to 0.15, which suggests that the sediment budgets could have been transported in maybe one to two months of the year if channel forming conditions were sustained. And the implication here is that all you would need are a couple extra weeks of channel forming conditions per year to potentially drastically increase the annual sediment budget. I don't want to go into that too much, um, just because I have a slight issue with how we interpret those sediment transport intermittency factors, but I'll come back to that in the discussion. So what we want to do now is, now that we've estimated our flow intermittency factors, we want to try and contextualize these numbers with respect to independent insights into hydroclimate at the time, but also fascist observations that we can make. So we used outputs of had cm 3 l general circulation model, but we can also have a look in literature to see what other authors using other GCMs predicted. Um, generally, there's consistency. Um, other GCMs point to mean annual precipitations that had similar values of order 1,800 millimeters per year. But importantly, most GCMs point to this area being characterized by a very monsoonal climate. And this is kind of expected due to the proximity of a high elevation mountain uh, to a warm seaway. Now, if we did have a very monsoonal climate, we might interpret our large flow intermittency factors to reflect high magnitude flood events were sustained um, for several weeks, several months of the year, as opposed to high magnitude flood events that had short durations, but very high frequencies. We can also pull on fascist observations to think about whether we think that scenario is reasonable. Um, so here's just an example of some of the kind of floodplain paleosols that we see. Um, you can see one of these channel deposits up here. Um, so we didn't study the paleosols in detail. We just made observations. But so the Ferron sandstone actually contains three different delta eight complexes. We studied the last chance delta eight complex but other authors have studied the floodplain deposits in the neighboring Noton Delta and found everything to be quite similar. And in general, these kinds of hydromorphic kind of glacials, they call them, generally point to kind of moisture rich conditions. Uh, it could be climate related, it could be related to the water table, but in general, it points to these floodplains being waterlogged for the majority of the year. Um, we also have observations of so kind of further down in the delta you can see a lot of kind of well-preserved organic material which might point to high sedimentation rates during discharge events um we also have i mean we started to make observations of so there are these variable discharge fascist models and the idea is that for different discharge regimes to kind of thinking of two m members so in a perennial discharge regime it's expected that you would have certain sedimentary structures um, abundant throughout your channel deposits, whereas in a more kind of subtropical monsoonal discharge regime, you might produce deposits that have other distinctive sedimentary structures. So we can start to look for those kinds of things as well. So in these fascist models, the kind of prevalence of soft sediment deformation is often attributed to subtropical monsoonal discharge regimes, but also where it's the active severe erogeny, this self sediment deformation could just be due to earthquakes or things like that. But these are kind of useful insights that we can use to start to kind of probe these questions of, do we think that discharge was sustained all year round? Do we think discharge events were high energy, et cetera, et cetera. So just to bring back that schematic, um, so we had our intermittency factors and we've started to pull on what else is out there in the literature we started to make some fascist observations. So we want to kind of decide, well, which hydrograph shape are we leaning towards? So do we think that flow was distributed in one large event? Um, or do we think it was distributed over the course of the year? And that's probably the more likely scenario. So our hydrograph shape is probably somewhere towards, oh, I've lost my cursor. So our hydrograph shape is probably something like this. My guess would be is that it's something more like D, except that the discharge, the highest discharges were higher. Um, 
one thing that I do want to highlight here is that we can potentially start to put some numbers to the y-axis on this schematic. So if we assume that our gravel transporting uh, flow conditions are the largest discharge conditions that are preserved in the stratigraphy, then we can start to put some upper limits on what that channel forming discharge was. Likewise, as I said, the Ferran sandstone is dominated by sand grade deposits. So if we think that our channel for, if our sand transporting flow conditions um, represent the kind of dominant channel forming condition, then we could potentially start to put values to some of the more kind of the mean conditions or like the seasonal low conditions. So there's lots of potential here, basically. Um, if we have flow intermittency factors and we have good observations of fasces and there's been a lot of other work in the area looking at kind of paleosols, et cetera, et cetera. We can start to build a picture up of what the hydrograph shape might have been. Um, so I wanted to take this a little bit further um, and try to think about whether modern observations of flow intermittency factors could potentially help us even more. So flow intermittency factors, they're very simple metrics, so they're very easy to calculate. However, we don't actually have many constraints on flow intermittency factors for modern systems. So I found that in literature, we tend to use more complex metrics, such as the discharge seasonality index, um, the precipitation seasonality index, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if you're interested, there's a good review by Hans Peter Al um, from 2020, which you can have a look at. So this is great that we can have them, but this is kind of hard to achieve for the geological past. So what I did was I thought, okay, well, if I can make some global maps of flow intermittency factors in modern catchments, then this is potentially useful for the geological past. So what I did was I took modern climate data. So I used the World Clim uh, climate records, which are historic records of the last kind of, well, over the recent 30 years of climate data. Um, and with these, I just took publicly available watersheds and then use zonal statistics to calculate catchment average climate variables. So I calculated the mean annual precipitation, the mean precipitation of the wettest months. And just as I did for my ancient example, I used that to estimate the flow intermittency factor. Again, this is assuming a runoff rainfall ratio of one. So where you have kind of more regional studies of what the runoff rainfall ratio would be, we can start to kind of tweak these values and we can kind of constrain this even further. Um, so yeah, it seems like we can use climate data to make some first order estimates of flow intermittency. I'm currently in the process of trying to kind of verify um, these constraints with publicly available gauge data to see just how effective using climate data is. Um, and with this, we can go on to produce some kind of global compilations. And so the idea is that if you're looking in the geological past, if you have an, a catchment and you have good understanding of the tectonic regime, the climatic regime, the land cover, et cetera, et cetera. There's potential to find an appropriate modern analog, which you can then go to and have a look at what the flow intermittency factor is. Now, finally, just to circle back to the sediment transport intermittency factors and why I think they're currently quite difficult to interpret. Um, so, well, just first of all, just thinking about sediment transport intermittency in modern catchments, this is potentially a lot more difficult to make global scale estimates of, and we might have to do it on a catchment by catchment approach. Um, however, importantly, it's also difficult to interpret sediment transport intermittency. And I'm gonna try and convey this using an analogy, <laughs> which I have never tried before. So I might do this once and then I might never do it again. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna pretend, so this is our same schematic, T naught to T1 is time. So our flow intermittency is now the intermittency of me drinking water. So over the course of a year, you have the amount of water that I drink. You know, if I'm being good, I have eight glasses a day, um, but I have a capacity. So over the course of a year, I drink various amounts of water and I can estimate the intermittency factor of my water consumption, which is probably about 0.7. So I think that's quite good. And the point I want to make here is that there's a climate signal there. I drink more water in the summer months and less water in the winter months. That's fine. We're happy with the flow intermittency factor. However, for the sediment transport intermittency, my analogy is going to be my tea consumption. 
So again, here we have my consumption of tea over the course of the year. Um, I drink less tea in the summer, but more tea in the winter. Um, so again, there is a climate signal. I hypothetically drink more tea in the winter and I can estimate the intermittency factor of my tea consumption, which is 0.44. So importantly, it's important to note that the tea intermittency is lower than my water intermittency. And we also expect this for flow intermittency and sediment transport intermittency. We expect that our sediment transport intermittency should be lower. If our sediment transport intermittency is higher, this is probably pointing towards some kind of debris flow dominated system where flow is just super saturated with sediment. Now, hypothetically, we can estimate our T intermittency factors, and we can potentially use this to try and get at what could kind of what was the climate signal? How was my tea consumption distributed in time? However, the issue with this is supply. And this is the exact same for modern systems. So I might not have access to tea for whatever reason. It could be that I just moved to America and I can't get hold of my Yorkshire tea bags. So I have to wait till I go home at Christmas. Or maybe my kettle's broken. I don't know. For whatever reason, I might not have access to tea. And this is the exact same as sediment in modern systems. Our sediment transport intermittency factor assumes that our system is transport limited, whereas in actual fact, it's likely to be supply limited. Maybe we don't, we're not eroding material in the source region. Maybe we have dams upstream. Supply could be limited for many reasons. And what this acts to do is it acts to lower our estimated sediment transport intermittency factor. So while the actual T intermittency factor might be 0.44, when you take into account the effect of supply, it drops down and it could be something lower, so such as 0.2. So it would be great if we could estimate modern sediment transport intermittency factors and use them to help understand the past, because there is potentially a climate signal in there that we could um, leverage and use to learn more. However, we need to figure out how we're going to deal with the supply issue, how we're going to figure out whether or not we can account for it. Um, so that's something that we're thinking about now and we're trying to take further. So just to end there, so I guess the main points I wanted to make is that assuming an intimacy factor is crucial to kind of jump from instantaneous conditions to mean conditions and vice versa. Um, and where we can calculate the intermittency factor, we suddenly have the potential to explore that in between time scale. So how flow and sediment transport is distributed in time. Um, exploring that in between time scale requires coupling of qualitative insights, such as Fashi's observations, um, with quantitative insights, such as Fashi's measurements and the application of flow and sediment transport models. And finally, I guess modern observations may help with this. Um, I think modern observations of flow intermittency will help, but I'm currently not sure about sediment transport intermittency. Uh, but this is something that we're actively working on and we're hoping to take forwards. So yeah, if you want to know more, um, this paper was published a week or two ago in GSA Bulletin. So there's a lot more info in there. And if you have any questions, feel free to drop me an email or get in touch. So that's everything from me. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. wonderful. Thank you very much, Sinead. It was super, super, super cool talk. I love the the analogy with the tea and water consumption, definitely. <laughs> so now we are open to questions. Please write your question in the chat and then be sure to send it to everyone. Also, please remember to write your name and where are you watching at? So, but I have a question first, Sinead. Um, I was thinking you show um, this super cool uh, integration of the flow intermediacy across the world. And I was thinking on the modern analogs, actually. I was thinking like, what do you think would be a, a good analog for the example that you show from Utah? I mean, from a mon modern monsoonal system. Um, so I would, I would so just given, I would kind of think of some of the rivers draining the Himalayas in terms of the kind of thinking of the kind of tectonic regime, but also the kind of monsoonal climate. I would lean towards those. Um, it would be nice to have intermittency estimates uh, for those rivers to compare them with, but did not at the time. Um, I think there are very few constraints on 
modern sediment transport into intimacy factors in literature. I think one of the main ones that um, I often come across is the Mississippi River. So, well, this paper is a decade old now, but um, at the time, uh, the, the sediment transport intermittency factor of the Mississippi was calculated as 0.33. So this is the Mississippi, you know, we're thinking it's it's moving water and sediment all year round, but it has an intermittency factor of 0.33, which was um, larger than what we have for the ferrets. But yeah, ideally, we would have more constraints in modern systems with which to compare, because that helps our understanding of ancient systems when we do that. Right. So we have some questions from the people in the chat. So hi, Jeanette, very nice talk, thank you. I am interested in the quantification of the errors in your estimate. Several parameters that you estimate probably come with large error bounds. To, for example, Turonian precipitation from the climate model, mining factor, shear stress, flow velocity, sediment volume estimations, geochronology of the sediments, However, some of your intermittency have a pretty low range. Can you propagate the errors of the parameter used in these inter, in, sorry, in these interfactor estimations? This is from Anne Berhan from University of Berlin. Yeah, thanks for that question, Anne. Yeah, that's um, that's a very good point. <laughs> there is a lot of uncertainty in most of the parameters that we require to estimate our intermittency factors. Um, so what we do, so just for, for the instantaneous uh, conditions, so we're taking our field observations, you know, if we've measured grain sizes, flow depths, et cetera, et cetera, in the field, from those measurements, we might have a mean and a standard deviation. And we took that range and we propagated that range through. Um, then in terms of the parameters such as, so when we're trying to estimate things like flow velocity, paleoslope, water discharges, sediment fluxes, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of those equations, um, I guess, especially where they, they are empirically derived, uh, the constants, they usually report a mean and a standard deviation um, or some other kind of uncertainty might be flagged in the text. And again, what we did there was we took that kind of whole range into account and we kind of propagated that through. Um, if you're So that's when I present a range in values, I'm presenting the range that comes from propagating a spread of plausible values through the workflow. Um, if you're interested in this, by the way, it's it's all in the supplement of the paper, <laughs> if you're brave enough. Um, likewise, for the mean conditions, um, so we needed, just for example, we needed estimates of the catchment area. So we basically compiled as many paleogeographies as we could find, um, and we kind of came up with a plausible range of values. We also supplemented that with estimates of catchment areas that we pulled from paleo digital elevation models. Again, we came up with a range of values, we put that through. Same for the relief, same for the temperature precipitation. So everything had a range of values. Um, we, I guess the goal is to try and narrow that uncertainty as best as possible. I don't know the extent to which we can do that. I feel like when we're dealing with, when we're dealing with instantaneous, flow and sediment transport equations, my impression is that uncertainties in Manning's N or various constants in a paleoslope equation, those uncertainties are insignificant relative to the uncertainties in the flow depth and the flow width. So my impression is for minimizing uncertainty with those estimates, your best bet is to try and get really accurate constraints on what your channel geometries were, because those are going to determine the order of magnitude of your results. Whereas for mean conditions, it's it's a first order estimate. I I don't think we can narrow down what catchment areas were, what catchment relief was. I think we just have to accept that what we have is a first order estimate. And um, I hope that answered that question. I did just ramble a bit. Uh, it was it was a very comprehensive answer, I would say. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, answer. And thank you, and he did it. So we have another question from Ellen Chamberlain from Bucknell University, so your neighbor. Um, so Helen said, how does the uncertainty compare between the instantaneous measurements and the mean for ancient? I think that's kind of similar. Yeah, so I guess, so I think the uncertainties are much larger for the mean conditions. Um, 
So for the for the instantaneous conditions, we're quite confident on the flow depth estimates. Um, flow widths have been reported in literature. So for the Farron, for the trunk channels of the Farron sandstone, they've been kind of put as around 250 meters. So we allowed for 200 to 300 meters just to be safe. Um, but generally, the geometries are quite well constrained, and everyone is pretty happy that that is a single thread meandering trunk channel. Like it's not a braided system where we have to consider the geometries of not well, not only how many active threads we have, but also the geometries of those. So I think that we're quite content that the uncertainties and errors that would come from those instantaneous estimates are a lot narrower than the uncertainties that come from the mean conditions. Um, I, I don't know if anyone remembers, but I did show a picture of um, some of the gravel grade sediments. Um, so traditionally in literature, um, the Farron sandstone was entirely sourced from the Severe Highlands. Um, for different time slices in the late Cretaceous, people have alluded to possibly some like sourcing at times coming from the south, maybe even like the magmatic uh, kind of Cordillera. Um, we, when we were looking at those pebbly lags, um, we were doing Woolman counts, measuring the gravel fraction. There was basalt in there. There was a lot of basalt. That was not coming from the severe. <laughs> that was coming from somewhere further south. So we, yeah, we were very generous with our range for catchment area, knowing that the catchment area at times could have been a lot larger. So yeah, if any, if anyone out there can do provenance. <laughs> Yeah, we would like to know. I, I, what also, also like having the approach from sink to source is also great. You have like the the estimation of the catchment area too. Um, yeah. Okay, <laughs> we have another question from Jim Hickey from Dallas, Texas. James says, "Very good talk, thanks." Are these additional challenges in calibrating mean and instantaneous flow conditions in a pre vegetation system where channel forming flow may be more difficult to recognize? Yeah, so I think, I guess so, in a pre-vegetation system, regardless of what you have, so regardless of what channel deposit you have, whatever produced that deposit must have been a channel forming flow. We might not know exactly what the flow condition was. We might not know if it was a bankful flow, a flood, or just ordinary flow, but just by the presence of channel deposits, a channel forming flow had to produce them. Um, I think one of the issues with pre-vegetation systems um, will come down to kind of, you, you could feasibly estimate an intermittency factor, but then when you're looking at fascist observations, uh, when you're making fascist observations to try and contextualize your intermittency factors, that's where you may run into issues. Um, you like pre-vegetation floodplains, are going to look very different to post vegetation floodplains. We don't necessarily know what they look like. Um, so it might be trickier to try and figure out, okay, what was the land cover like? How well drained were the floodplains? I think that's where we might run into issues. Um, but yeah, other than that, I'm not sure. What it, I guess the other issues would be if you're applying flow and sediment transport equations to pre vegetation fluvial strata. Like if those were empirically derived flow and sediment transport equations, then they were probably derived from modern systems, which are the majority like vegetated. So just as an example, there's a paleoslope equation uh, by Trampish et al. from 2014. Um, that's an empirically derived equation based on, I think, over 500 observations of modern rivers. Um, again, most of those are probably going to be vegetated. So that would raise questions as to the extent to which you might want to apply that empirical equation to pre-vegetation fluvial strata. Yeah, it's a pending research question. Very cool. Uh, we have another question from Jago Bass from Wales. Jago said, thanks, I'm curious, how do you estimate the shear stress, shear stress in the slope angle equation since grain size only gives a critical shear stress? So, um, so what we did, so I just gave that equation as an example. Um, but in the paper, we did use uh, the Trampush slope equation. But yeah, so if you were to use that, so 
what I have done before is I've estimated. So if you just take a bed form stability diagram, you can look for a given grain size. So you can make observations of the sedimentary structures that are present in your channel deposit. So usually it was dunes cross bedding, uh, so dune scale cross bedding. So we can look at the range of shear stresses um, under which dunes are stable. And that's something that we can then use to propagate in. Um, there are various empirical equations to estimate what the critical shear stress is. Um, so I think the critical shear stress came up in the Mayor Peter and Muller, and that's normally just an assumed value. Um, but yeah, these are things that I tend to not worry about just because the, the slight difference in the critical shear stress that I use is like the uncertainty that comes with that is negligible relative to the uncertainty and what flow width was, you know, if my flow width was, if I think it's 10 meters, but it's 100 meters, you know, that's going to impact the order of magnitude of our results. But when it's coming down to like minor details, such as critical shear stress, those uncertainties, we're less worried about, but we can estimate them if need be. Cool, very cool. We have our last question from Hanan from Pakistan, and he says, Hi, Jeanette. Hi, Jeanette. Wonderful work. Could we estimate mean annual fluvial precipitation from intermittency factors, including catchment areas and distributor, distributory mouse bar systems? Yeah, so I guess the, the, the original purpose of the intermittency factor, so it was first introduced by Chris Paola. Um, it was a basin research paper yeah, from 1992. And the goal was they they were using instantaneous sediment transport equations, but they wanted to look at sediment transport on longer geological timescales. So they basically just assumed a value and called it an intermittency factor as just a dimensionless time averaging value. So in theory, if you had a system where you knew what the instantaneous flow, like water discharge or sediment transport was, and you knew what the intermittency factor was, you could then use it as per its original intention to upscale your instantaneous condition to a mean condition. Um, the issue is like you have to assume the value. Um, if you were in the position to estimate the intermittency factor, that implies that you already know what the mean conditions are. Um, so I guess this for something like, so I did this for the last chance, Farron Delta in the Farron Sandstone. So maybe other researchers who are working on the other Farron deltas, such as the Noton Delta, maybe they could take these intermittency factors to upscale estimates of water discharge to mean annual water discharge for those adjacent ones, just kind of making the assumption that, you know, it's a similar setting, similar climate, that kind of thing. So in theory, yes, you can. Very cool, very cool. Thank you very much, Jeanette. That was a wonderful kickoff for our fourth season of Says Online. So we are we were really, really happy to have you today. So Thank I'm you. going to close this webinar now. Thank you again, Jeanette. And please remind, um, I would like to remind you that if you are a master student or a PhD student working on diagenesis, please sign up for our upcoming Sets Online student webinar, which is going to be about the difficulties on, of diagenesis. So thank you all for attending to this very interesting talk today. And thank you so much, Jeanette, for being here today.